Last night, we talked about the disciples experiencing revival. And in a nutshell, I'm going to say that they gathered in the upper room at Jesus' command. If you remember, in two different places, in one place Jesus told them not to leave but wait in the city, and in another place it says tear a little longer in Jerusalem. You remember? That was not a good place to wait. Jerusalem was not a good place. They were persecuted there. It would have been easier to just run and hide. But Jesus told them to wait and pray for the promise of the Holy Spirit. You remember that, don't you? Well, as we pick it up from last night, I want to start with a story. Uh, You probably have heard it on the internet, I don't know. Uh, My father and my grandfather were very committed, very committed, more than I've seen in my life. And they worked really hard for God, but they also prayed really hard. And my father would repeat to me that quotation, if you remember the quotation, where Ellen White says that the great battles are not won through arguments, who remember the quotation, through our methods and so on, but are won in the chamber of prayer. The great battles. And my father would say to me, son, it's not how much you work, it's not how hard you work, it's not how educated you are, it's not how smart you are. It is how much you pray. Because people of faith, Abraham, Moses, and so on and so forth, they were different, not because they were smarter, but because they prayed more. They were not super men eating super uh, food and driving super car and using super glue. They were regular people. They were just normal people with the same temptations like you and me. In fact, Moses was a little tempered, if you remember. Am I right? Abraham had the habit to distort the truth, you know. She is my sister. So they were people. They were normal people. But they prayed so much to the degree that eventually God could literally take control. So my father would say to me, you will never accomplish anything in your life, in your family, with your children, wherever you go, whatever you do, in your business, you will never accomplish anything. You will just struggle and never make any progress unless you learn to pray. That was a big thing because we talk a lot about prayer, don't we? Oh, we know the theology of prayer. But we don't really pray. And so, continuing, Jesus Picking up from last night. Jesus told the disciples to wait and pray. Now, I want you to listen to this story as we pick it up. My father was a man of prayer. He, among other things, he was a carpenter. But among other things, he smuggled Bibles in the country. It was against the law. For more than 20 years, maybe every other week, more or less, and I did that quite a few times. In fact, since I was small, when I started to learn how to write, my father gave me work to do. He put me in a closet. He insulated the closet with foam and pillows. And he put a comfortable seat. And the typewriter, you remember? Those old crazy things? He insulated so there would be no noise heard to the next apartment, the neighbors. And he said, you want money to buy a bike? I'm going to pay you five cents a page. And he gave me to duplicate the uh, Sabbath school lessons, the Spirit of Prophecy books. And he would pay me, and because I wanted to make money, I would put those blue things between the pages. I don't know how you call them. So I make many copies in the same time. And I remember, because I put seven, eight of them, the ink would not go through all to the last one. And I would have to hit hard in the buttons until I had pain in my fingers. And my father would say, do less pages. You get the money anyway. (laughs) And I would duplicate the books, and he would spread them in the night. He would go in the church, leave them under the seat, leave them, and people would get books. It was against the law to, to have them. And so... And he would tell me, you don't talk about it. If you talk about it, we all go to prison. And what do I say if they ask me? And my father said, you don't have to say anything. You just keep quiet. People cannot force you to talk. 
And so anyway, my father duplicated books. He, he, he built churches. He did Bible studies. He would go from village to village and plant churches in new locations where there was no church. And I remember we built a church. And probably you know the story. But this is what moved me until today. Among many miracles that God did for him. Like one time the police came and we had over 40 boxes of Bibles in our little living room. Little living room. When I say little, you will not believe uh, smaller than our bathroom right now, you know, the little living room. And in that living room, we had 40 boxes right in the middle. And the police came in the middle of the night. We got a tip, you have Bibles. And uh, my father said, come in and check. They came and they turned the house upside down. And they were just looking in the drawers, looking in the everywhere. And they would go around the boxes in the living room without bumping into the boxes, without seeing them, like totally blind. And after two, three hours, they said, nothing here, and they left. God blinded them, like people at Sodom and Gomorrah that were going around Lot's house, you remember? And many stories like that. But I'm not going to go to those stories. I'm going to go to the one that I don't like. And eventually, they took my father to the police station, long time after we built a church. And they said, we know that you led it. We know that you are in control of it. We know that you brought the materials. We know that you paid for this and that. We know that you are the head behind it. And we told you to stop bringing Bibles. We told you to stop doing construction churches, you know. And you don't stop. So we have to, tell, to, to stop you. We have to stop you. And so they asked him, are you going to stop? And my father said, I cannot. Why? Because I love God. But we are going to kill you. And my father answered, it's absolute a privilege to die for Jesus. I don't live for this life. This is just transitory. My focus is not here. My focus is there. And they said, you are crazy. And my father said, absolutely agree. <laughs> he said, to love God, it's craziness for you. But for me, you are crazy not to love him. And... Uh, they talked to the chief of police, talked to the, everyone. They said, we are not going to stop this guy. He's, he just cannot be stopped. And they said in front of him, if we kill him, the whole city knows this man. We are going to make him a martyr. We need to do it in a way that nobody knows. So they put him in a room. We don't know. We have no proof that that happened. We don't know. In the morning, they came. People dressed in white with a mask. They came and said, you can go home. Opened the door. He left the room. He came home and he said, they just put me in a room. <clears throat> they said, we need to kill him quietly, and they put me in a room. A week later, he started to bleed from the nose, from the ear. A couple of weeks later, he had diarrhea with blood. He started to lose his hair. We took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, you have been irradiated. And the doctor gave a number. I don't remember. It was tens or something. But so many thousand units, the doctor said, that is way above the normal level. And the doctor said, you have about two, three weeks to live. That's it. Your spine stopped, your organs stopped. Uh, basically, you, you are not going to make it. He lived another six months. We prayed like crazy. I prayed like never before in my life. Lord, I've seen you doing miracles before. When this and that and that, I know you can do it. Please, would you do it? And after six months of prayer, he still died. And I remember just before he died, we were in his bedroom. He was in the bed. He could hardly move. He could, not, could hardly talk. And so he was pale. And I was with my mom and my sisters next to him. And I started to pray, Lord, I know you can even resurrect him from the dead. And my father put his hand over me and said, enough. Stop it. And he said, God heard you from the beginning. If he wanted to heal me, he would have done it. If he says no, he told no to Jesus, you have to drink the cup. If he says no, who am I to go against God's plan? And then he says, Paul was beheaded. John the Baptist was beheaded. Many martyrs paid with their life. And they went to death singing. Why don't you accept God's will? And I just could not. I said, now God can heal you. He has to heal you. 
And my father shook his head and said, you don't know God yet. You don't know God. I said, yes, I do. He said, no, you don't, and you don't love him. I said, yes, I do. He said, no, you don't. You just think you do, and you don't know that you don't. He said, because if you really love God, to die for him, it's an undeserved privilege. I said, God can do a miracle. I just need more faith. And my father said, faith is not to force God to do what you ask. And he said, it takes a lot more faith not to see a miracle than to see one. You follow me? A lot more faith not to see a miracle. And he said to me, son, under big trees, nothing grows. Sometimes you have to cut the big trees so others would grow. I said, what do you mean? He said, in our church, there are many good people, but none of them work. <laughs> and he said, it's better for me if I go, so the others have no choice, but they start to work. And he said, he said, I accepted God's plan. And then he looked to mom. Mom was crying. I said, honey, I know my Redeemer. I know my Redeemer. And even if my skin is going to perish, my eyes will see him. I want you to put that on my stone, and I want you to stop crying because we have a God who is real. We are not like the others, hopeless. I want you to understand that Jesus is coming. And so now stop praying for my healing. Let me pray for you. And he prayed, Lord, I want them to know you to the degree that they will be happy to even die for you and to make you the priority to the degree that they forget self. Because unless they know you and love you more than anything, I will not see them in heaven. Listen carefully. Unless they love you more than self, they cannot go to heaven. I wonder and ask myself, how many people, honest, good people in our church, love God more than self to the degree that joyfully you die for God? You follow me? Because if you don't love him that way, you actually don't worship him. Whatever you love more, that's what you worship. That's your God. You may think you worship God, but you worship the beast. You follow me? I remember when I was a kid, I was in fifth grade, a guy came to me and he said, I hate my church, Greek Orthodox Church. I said, why, man? He says, because my father has me kill the dra- kiss the dragon. I said, what? My father has St. Peter picture at home. And St. Peter is on a horse and he has a pitchfork and he's killing the dragon. And my father has us kiss the icon. And my father is tall and he kisses St. Peter. And he wants me to kiss the picture, but I never reach to kiss St. Peter, so I kiss the dragon. <laughs> That's what we do. We think we kiss Jesus, but we kiss something else. Hello? Did you hear what I said? Because whatever you have hard time to surrender, that's what you kiss. And so my father prayed for us, and then he closed his eyes. And two more hours in coma, and he was gone. It took me three months. I could not pray. I could not go to church. I was angry with God. It took me three months to recover and to accept it. So I go back now. And Ellen White says in the book of Acts of the Apostles, going from page 35 on, she says, and I want you to listen carefully. We don't have time to go through all of it. But I want you to listen carefully. Uh, She, okay, this is the wrong presentation. Okay. I want you to listen carefully. She says that the disciples gathered in the upper room out of fear of the Pharisees. But then as they prayed for protection, so what they were focused on, what they were thinking of, why, why were they there? I want you to, to follow the events, how they developed. Why were the disciples in the upper room initially? Fear of Pharisees, it says in the Bible, it says in the spirit of prophecy, clear. They were out of fear, and they prayed for protection in the beginning, as we do. Heal me, bless me, nothing wrong with that. But as they prayed, she says they remembered what Jesus told them. 
And she says, they obeyed, quote, she says, they obeyed Jesus' command, close quotation. These very words, you can, you can check it in the book of Acts of the Apostles. They obeyed Jesus' command to wait and to pray for the promise of the Holy Spirit. They obeyed Jesus' command. They obeyed Jesus' command. So they switched their prayer. The more they prayed, the, the closer they got to God, the closer they got to God, the more they realized we are praying the wrong prayer. How many times do we pray the wrong prayer? And they switch their prayer from praying for self to praying for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And she says they realized that they will never have the power to do anything to fulfill their mission before the Holy Spirit came. Now I want you to listen to these points. And I want you to memorize these points. They are not easy to be memorized, but I bet you will manage because you have good memory. Okay. Uh, Okay, right here. Let's see if I get the right slide. Uh, now, let's go to the next one. Oops. Okay, next one. Yay! The disciples got in the upper room and they prayed. What is the next word? Together. I want you to Meditate upon this word together. Why together? Because the Bible says, Jesus says, and Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus cannot lie. Jesus says, whenever two or three come together, I will be in their midst. And then if you keep reading a few more verses, he says, because whenever, because whenever two or three pray in one accord, that doesn't mean that they are in a Honda Accord. That means that they pray, Elena says, in the unity of purpose, they pray together for one thing. They, and then if you look, I'm going to give you the quotation where she says, they didn't ask for a blessing for themselves, though they had needs. They didn't pray. In this moment, they didn't pray for protection. They didn't. I want you to remember, uh, David, King David in the wilderness of Judea, Psalm 63, Psalm 63, in the wilderness of Judea, he had 600 soldiers with him, their wives... And their children, how many people? 600 soldiers, their wives, and their children. We talk roughly over 2,000 people. Have you been in the wilderness of Judea? How many people have been there? I've been there. You know what is there? I tell you exactly, nothing. I don't even know why Palestine and Israel fight for that land. Because I don't need it. There is nothing there. When I was there, I got off the bus, and the guy says, this is the wilderness of Judea. Sand and rocks as far as you could see. No trees, no flowers, no water, no grass, nothing. It was 127 Fahrenheit. If you would put an egg in the sand, in one minute you would be boiled. It was so hot you would get headaches. And I wanted to walk in the wilderness of Judea. And the guy said, no! I said, why? And he took a rock and he threw it. And there were scorpions coming from under the sand. Scorpions! Snakes? He said, it's dangerous. In that wilderness, David, together with about more or less 2,000 people, were hiding in those over 10,000 caves. There are 10,000 caves there around Masada. 10,000 caves. And he was hiding from cave to cave. If you were him in that wilderness, and you have to feed 2,000 people, and you have to give water to 2,000 people, and you have to protect... Protect 2,000 people and their children. What would you pray for? Do you follow me? I know precisely because I hear people praying. Lord, give me this and give me that. You follow me? The Bible says, and the spirit of prophecy also, that he did not pray for their needs. That's pretty strong. Pastor, you tell me that I should not pray for my needs. No! I am telling you that you could pray for your needs as long as you have other priorities. And your needs are not the priority. My father used to say, you are not God. He comes first. It says there in Psalm 63, in a dry land, the title is a Psalm of David in the wilderness of Judea while he was running from King Saul. In the dry land where there is no water, I've seen you in your sanctuary. 
Your presence is better than food. Your presence is better than water. I want you more than life. I want you and nothing else. When I am with you, I am happy. I don't need anything. He doesn't pray for water. He doesn't pray for justice. He doesn't pray for protection. He doesn't ask anything except I want you. This is something that we just don't get. Because we are too focused on self. The disciples, Elena White says, did not ask for a blessing for themselves, though they had many needs. They prayed in one accord together for one thing. What was that? What did they pray for? She says, for the promise of the gift. She calls the Holy Spirit the gift. For the promise of the gift. They prayed for the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said, wait and pray. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. Then go. The reason we have no power in our life, in our families, in our churches, is because we don't understand this. And let's go through the sequence. The disciples prayed together. 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 Whenever two or three ask something, Jesus says in one accord, that means in unity. We all give up everything else. We all unite and we all ask one thing. When we pray together in unity, God says it will be given to them. It's clear. There is no maybe, hopefully, it will be given to them. Plain. So why don't we do it? She says in a different quotation, if I have time, I will show it to you. She says, this subject, the Holy Spirit, is little tucked off in the church, little considered, while all the other things get priority. In a different quotation, Satan knows that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive power, and he wants us to be ignorant of our needs. In a different quotation, she says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will bring all, how many? All other gifts, all, all. How, many, how much is all? In its train. That's what she says. Well, let me explain what all means. Let's suppose you have a Toyota Camry 1972. What year? 72. Is that old? It coughs. It, you know, that type of car, rotten, rusted, holes in the floor. We had a, a Dacia, a Romanian car, a Renault. Who knows French cars, Renault? It was a Renault 10. It was small, like you keep your knees in your mouth. You know? We had a 1969, a 19, my wife and I, that was our first car, 1969 Renault 10. And I was carrying Bibles with that car. You can read in my first book. I was carrying Bibles, and I had an accident after three trips. The police came, and they did not check the car to see over 2,000 Bibles in the car. <clears throat> anyway, so, going back, you have a Toyota Camry 1972, whatever, doesn't matter. And your car is totally broken, a junk. And I am your father, and I own the Toyota dealer in the town. And I own the Chevy dealer. You don't like Chevy? Okay, I own the Mercedes dealer. Are you happy now? <laughs> and I own the Porsche dealer, and I own the Tesla dealer, okay, whatever you want. And I own the um, Maserati. You like Maserati? Okay, the Maserati dealer. And I own the Volvo and the BMW. I own 10, 15 dealers. I am filthy rich. I am a multi, multi, multi millionaire. I, basically, and you come to me. And you say, Daddy, please, can you give me a bumper? My bumper dropped on the interstate. It was rusted and I lost my bumper. And I look to you and shake my head. I say, what's wrong with you? I can give you the dealership. Just come and be with me. And the dealership is yours. You can pick any car you wish. You can pick a Mercedes. You can pick a, a, a Porsche, a BMW convertible. It's yours, a new one. Why would you want to fix the junk and tomorrow it breaks again because it's broken? It's all broken. You say, Daddy, you don't hear me. I need a bumper. And I said, no, you don't hear me. You don't need a bumper. You need a new car. And I will give it to you if you come to be with me. And you don't get it. You want a bumper. I give you the bumper because you are blind and deaf. And next day you come, my alternator broke. I said, son, you don't need an alternator. Come and be with me. I give you the dealer. It's yours. You are my son. And say, no, 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 no. I need an alternator. Do you get the picture? 
That's what we do. We go to God, give me a bumper, give me an alternator, give me a starter, give me a battery. We don't say, give me the Holy Spirit. Because when you get the Holy Spirit, all other things come. And your problem that you think it's your problem and you pray for, that's not your problem. That's what Satan makes you think. Your problem is that you miss the Holy Spirit presence. That's your real problem. Because if the Holy Spirit comes in your life, then the other things all are taken care of by, the, by itself. You, you don't have to struggle. This is not a promise that if the Holy Spirit comes, you are going to be a millionaire and have a dealership. I'm not talking about that. This is the promise that when the Holy Spirit comes, power comes. And we lack power in our lives, and we lack power in our churches. Now, going back, the disciples, if you read the book of Acts of the Apostles from page 35 on, you literally find these things. I took them from there. Listen, the disciples, they prayed together, the word together, unity, one accord. They prayed together for the Holy Spirit. Then she says they humbled themselves. What? What is that? Who wants to be humbled? Anybody here? Volunteer? They humbled themselves. They acknowledged that they cannot do it. They are not worthy. They cannot. They humbled themselves. They didn't trust their wisdom, their education, their experience. They didn't trust their methods and strategies and plans. We have a board meeting and we talk four hours until everybody is tired and we come with another strategy and nothing happens. Is it bad to have a board meeting? No. But it is bad to depend on human methods instead of the Holy Spirit. Listen, they humble themselves, they acknowledge, they acknowledged, very simple, they acknowledged that they could not do it in their own power. Now I want you to think about this. When he says there that they humble themselves, very interesting. It says that they also confessed all their sins, including the bitterness between them. Very interesting. So many times people who leave the church don't leave the church because of doctrines, but leave the church because of tensions. Am I right? Yeah. They have been hurt in the church. The place that you are supposed to be safe, the place that you are supposed to find love is the place where they, excuse me, the power came, where they hammer you, you know? Or we hammer others. Who are you? To judge somebody else. God called you to love and to save, not to judge. Don't do God's job. God is the judge. If you judge somebody, even in your mind, you are sick, spiritually sick. You need to be prayed for. You take Satan's character upon yourself. Satan, the Greek name, is ho antidikos. That means the judger, the criticizer of his brethren. And the Lenoi says, every time we judge others, we do Satan's job. Who are you? The Bible says, don't judge. With the measure you judge, with that measure you will be judged. It's God's job. Satan is trying to do God's job. God says, don't do that. You are called to save. Now they confess their sins. And if you read in the book of Acts of the Apostles, what they did... They went to one another and said, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And any dissension, any tension, any division disappeared. And she says, thus preparing the way for the coming of the Holy Spirit. When they solved the, the, the division, the problems, they prepared the way for the Holy Spirit to come. So now you know what you need to do for the Holy Spirit to come. You follow me? Now going back. She says, they put away any differences and became one, what Jesus prayed, perfect unity. Wouldn't that be nice to be in the church? And then she says, they repeated Jesus' teachings, they meditated upon his sacrifice, and they repeated the prophecies related to Messiah. They repeated Jesus' teachings, looked over his sacrifice, and this is big, 
big, big. If you look in the Cyro of Ages, there is that famous quotation, for thee, the Son of Man came, you remember, and took your sin. For you, she says, for thee. For you, he became sin. For you, he was beaten. For you, he was crucified. For you, he, the Son of God. Can you grasp that? That God, the Almighty, the Holy, that angels cover themselves and sing holy, holy, holy. That the whole universe worships. That he's so glorious that in his presence things would melt down. That God would come down here and take your sin and my sin. Though he is holy. And he would die on the cross so you can be saved. Who do you think you are? That God would die specifically for you. You follow me? And then Ellen White says something gigantic that I never caught before. She says, when they understood that God died for them, they finally loved him more than anything else. Hold on a second. She says they finally loved him more than... That that means that they didn't love him before? That's what I grabbed, actually. They finally, when they understood the cross, she says, loved him. That means that they didn't really... They thought they loved him. Can it be that you think you love him, but you actually don't? Do you follow me? They finally loved him more than anything else. They finally loved him more than anything else. Listen. When they started to look into Jesus' teachings and the prophecies, and they realized, whoa, he's the lamb that we are sacrificing. He's the one who split the Red Sea when he came out of Egypt. He's the one that gave the law on Sinai. He's the one that was the cloud and the pillar. He's the one that gave Jericho. He is the one. He is God. The Almighty. And he walked with us and we didn't know. God walked next to me and we ate together and we talked. Isn't that something? And she says when they processed that he, the Almighty, died. She says they were so overwhelmed. That his love grabbed their hearts and melted their hearts. And she says, in that moment, they finally loved him more than anything. So that tells me that before you see the cross, you'll never really love him. That's the reason, Eleanor says, it would be good for us to spend one. Uh Uh-uh, I got you. That was a tricky question. That's it. Thank you. Say again. One thoughtful hour. It's not enough to, you know, people say, I got to do my study. I got to read three chapters from the Bible and one chapter from the Spirit of Prophecy. Okay, one hour. Done. I feel good. One thoughtful hour. You got to reflect on it. You got to pray over it. You got to try to understand it. You got to meditate. She says at the foot of the cross, as you look into his sacrifice and meditate, reflect, behold on it. She says, behold the lamb. As you behold on it, she says, the more you understand the cross, you are transformed without human effort into his image. And Paul says, you are changed from glory to glory by beholding. The more you understand the cross, that's what my father said to me when he died. Son, you don't love Jesus yet. Because when you really understand the cross, you have no problem to die for him. When you understand that God died for you, God, who am I not to die for him? Whoa. So here we are, talk about selfish prayers. Lord, give me this and give me that and give me that. And then I says, listen, this is what you should pray for. Help me understand the cross to the degree that I am ready, instead of asking, give me, I am ready to say, from now on, I give you. Hello? It takes a little turn. And so, the disciples repeated Jesus' teachings, his sacrifice and the prophecies. And she says, when they did that, the Holy Spirit, quote, illuminated their mind. And they finally understood the cross. And they loved him more than anything. And then she says, from this moment... They could not help themselves. They, it was, she says, like a fire 
burning. They could not help anymore. They were like, wow! You understand? They were burning with a desire to tell the world. And she says they were preaching with boldness. And then she says something again interesting. They knew that their testimony is going to cost them their life. They knew it. But they, she says, didn't love their life anymore because they loved him. Whoa. So now I finally started to understand my father. I started to understand my father. So now I am asking you confession time. You don't need to confess out loud, but you should confess in your mind. Are you ready to joyfully, joyfully lay down your life for Jesus and consider it a privilege? Because if you are not, you have not yet understood the cross. Because when you understand the cross, it's going to totally transform you, the way you think, how you pray, what you do, and your priorities. And not only your life, because, oh, I'm happy to die for Jesus. Really? Because if I call you to a work, you are not happy to come. <laughs> you follow me? And we say, oh, I'm happy to die because you know nobody's going to ask you to die for Jesus. But if I ask you something small, you have hard time to surrender. Moreover, something big. And that tells us if you really have understood the cross. Because when you put your eyes and your mind on the cross, you really are so melted. His love compels you. So melted by his love that you really disappear. You forget self. You surrender self. Die to self. And you say like Paul, for me to live is Jesus and to die, it's a gain. How can you say that it's a gain to die? What's wrong with you? Huh. You understand? Now I understand why my father told to the police officer when he said, you are crazy. My father said, yes. Because to say for me to die, it's a gain, you must be crazy. <laughs> and so... They love him more than anything. They determined to share the world, the, the, to the world, Jesus, at any price. They were ready to joyfully surrender all. Oh. And then she ends, they took hold of the promise of the Holy Spirit by faith. They believed that God will actually answer the prayer. Isn't that beautiful? And now let me jump. I'm going to jump from slide 8, literally to slide 50-something. Because we, we don't have time. I'm going to jump. I mean that. It, there are 137 slides, five hours presentation. We jump. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm going to jump to the pioneers of our church. This is unbelievable. You will not believe it. You will just not believe it. It's just unheard of. Okay, I think... I think I found, yay, I found it. Slide 58, okay. Give me one prophetic second, please. Got it. Okay. Is this one? No, a little before. Okay, listen carefully. In how many of you have been in Maine where Ellen White and all the others were waiting for the second coming in 1844? Anybody has been there? I've been there. You have been there probably. It's the house, the, the little church where William Miller was preaching. And anyway, there next to the church and the house and so on and so forth, it's a mountain, it's not a big mountain, it's not Colorado or Montana, anything like that. It's a big hill. It's a mountain and it has a flat bedrock. Flat rock. It's amazing. It's just big and flat. On that rock, then the hill goes down and then another hill goes up. On that rock, the pioneers of our church were waiting that night for the second coming. I want you to be in their skin. Put yourself in their skin. You go on that rock and you say, Jesus is coming tonight. And it's 10 p.m. and 11 and 12 midnight and then 1 and you all sing and look up. Nothing. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4, 5, 6 a.m. And the day comes and Jesus didn't come. How would you feel about it? 
How would you feel about it? Totally devastated, am I right? Totally let down, confused. How were the disciples after the cross? Totally devastated, confused. We thought, you remember? We thought he would come tonight. We thought he would deliver Israel. We thought, and he died. Was it good or bad that he died? <laughs> what they thought was the greatest tragedy, in fact, was the greatest hope. Because without death, there will be no salvation for them. As they were disappointed, so the pioneers were disappointed. After they were disappointed, Ellen White says, the day were so confused. Many left the church. She says there was a handful of people left over, very confused, very disappointed. And she says, they got, now mark the words, together and prayed together. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, would confess their sin and turn around from their evil ways, that's repentance, and pray, I would heal the country and answer their prayer. They, the disciples got together, you remember the slide. Listen, what she says about the, 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 the pioneers. They got together and humbled themselves, recognizing their need, and recognizing that they just don't understand the Bible. And they need help. They humble themselves. They pray together for the Holy Spirit to illuminate their minds so they understand what happened. They pray together for the Holy Spirit. Do you see the parallel with the disciples? It's almost similar. They repeat it. Jesus teaches the prophecies and the sanctuary. She adds the sanctuary. They repeat it. Let's see what happens. They repeat the prophecies. They repeat the sanctuary. They pray for the Holy Spirit. And as they prayed, very interesting, she says that the Holy Spirit illuminated their mind. You remember that quotation from the disciples? And they understood when the Holy Spirit illuminated their mind, they understood, he says, the prophecies. Yes? No. They understood the, what does he say? They understood the cross. The pioneers, when the Holy Spirit came, after they prayed together, when they were confused that Jesus didn't come, when the Holy Spirit came, it helped them to understand what? The cross, this is the key. When our pioneers understood the cross, she says, they were ready to sacrifice everything to preach the gospel. I look in our churches. Are our people ready to sacrifice everything to preach the gospel? Now, why? Because they don't understand the cross. Now, Ellen White, I'm going to give you the quotations because these are important. She says, Jesus, 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 his righteousness, his sacrifice, his gift of salvation by faith. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He, she says, this message properly understood, this message properly understood, it will illuminate the whole world and finish the work. If this message is understood, and then she says, this is the third angel's message. Unfortunately, not talking about anybody particularly, just about me and all of us. We focus on a thousand subjects, but not always on this subject. And Satan knows that when you understand this subject, it's totally going to change your life. And so, I'm going to continue a little. So what happened? Now it's a history lesson, just a little. What happened? Ellen White understood that. The pioneers understood that. It changed everything. They started to preach. She says they sacrificed everything they had. Remember, the disciples sacrificed everything they had. Am I right? The pioneers sacrificed them because they understood this message. My father, I remember so many times when the church was built, he talked to my mom and, and he says, honey, how much should we give? And my mom says, how much do we have left over in the house? Because you gave already everything to the church. And my father said, well, shouldn't we? Jesus is coming. 
is going to burn anyway. The economy is going to drop. We are going to lose it anyway. Shouldn't we give it to Jesus because it's all his? Not only the 10%, but all is his? And my mom said, yes, but we need to keep something also in the house. <laughs> and my mom says, okay, we have 25,000 left over. And my father said, give it all. And mom says, can we keep 2,000 just for emergency? He's, my father said, no, Jesus is our emergency. Give it all. Who does that? And he and mom talked, prayed, gave it all. Next day, I remember my father came home with 10,000 in his pocket. He said, I got a plus job, side job. And he said, I got 10,000 today. And next day, he did a roof and he got another 6,000. He gave 25. Within two days, he got 26. And my mom says, God, God gave it all back. And my father said, no, God knew that the church needs more. Give it again. And then my mom looked to him and says, but God gave it back to us. And my father says, no, honey, if you keep it, God cannot give it. God cannot give you more because you already have. You need to keep giving so God could keep giving. Do you follow me? And my father said, don't you wonder why the others don't get it? Because they don't give it. <laughs> Isn't that something? And he says, they are afraid to give it because they are afraid they lose it. Hmm. I'm not talking about money. This is about heart. And again and again, my father would say, they don't give because they don't understand the cross. Now, going back to the same subject, the pioneers, they understood this. And Elena says, why didn't the latter rain had come? Why? She says, talking about 1844, they committed all... With no reservation. They committed how much? They committed all with no reservation. Now I want you to think about this. She says, talking to the church in 1856, we have never equaled that desire and love. We have never equaled, and I think it applies to us. There was a spirit of consecration education that is not today, she says. They are ready to sacrifice anything. I'm going to put it in my words because the paragraphs are long. And she says, why not today? Because conformity to the world and unwillingness to suffer for God. Now I want you to think. As you go to this slide. In 1856, she started to preach that. And James White started to preach that. Average, out one out of every five SDA members started to talk about revival. They got a message. Finally, the church got a message. You know how many members we had then? Who can guess? Altogether, roughly, roughly, more or less, 2,500 members. That's it. Now, they, most of them, one in five, she says, got it. They got it. They got it. And then she says they started to write and to preach on the third angel message and on the need to understand the cross and to love God more than anything. And as they did that, Ellen White started to preach, James White started to write articles. As they did that, something happened. She appealed to the church to get together, pray together for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, because unless the Holy Spirit comes, she said, we'll never finish the work. She said the Holy Spirit came as an early rain to enable the disciples to start the work. And the Holy Spirit needs to come as the latter rain to help us finish the work. She encouraged them to pray for the Holy Spirit. As she was preaching on that, they started to pray. And she says, God sent angels in every direction to prepare the world for the second coming. Now, let me tell you something that you may know, you may not know. Very important. They started to preach, they started to pray. Ellen White appealed to them to pray as the disciples prayed. In what month? They started to pray in November 1856. What month? November 1856. And they prayed until March 57, 1857. How long did they pray? Five months. Is that okay? Good or bad? 
And she says, when they started to pray, God sent angels to prepare the world for the second coming. In that time, when they started to pray, things started to happen. In that time, Jeremiah Lampier, who was a businessman, he was not a pastor, in New York, do you know this statue in New York? Is in front of the building of Bible Society, in front of the Central Park. You can go there and see it. Jeremiah Lampier appealed to the city of New York to come and pray together for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit from 12 to 1 noon in the Central Park. He put a banner, prayer for the Holy Spirit from 12 to 1 noon every day. You know how many people came? Six. Is that discouraging? Well, the Bible says whenever two or three, six is quite enough. Because people tell me, Pastor, we have only four in our church coming into prayer. Yeah, you don't pray. God could answer through four. And so, they started to pray. Our people started to pray, and they were praying for how many months? Listen what happened. The economy dropped following week. The economy collapsed. And the Lord says, God allowed it to wake them up. The economy collapsed. When the economy collapsed, next day, how many people came to prayer? Over 10,000. Because when COVID comes, when, when 9-11 comes, when the economy collapses, what do people do? They run to God. The, the, the whole Central Park was filled, and he says, every church in New York came to pray. Every church in New York, that's quite a lot. And then she says, every church prayed at 9 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. Every church, three times a day. And then the factories in New York would blow the horn at 15 to 12 to tell the workers that they are free paid to go in the Central Park to pray from 12, 12 to 1. All the factories. Isn't that something? And then she says, within six months, and the history says that on the internet, you can find it. Within six months, people started to get baptized. And there were 10 baptisms a week. I'm sorry, I said 10? Back up. 10,000. Let me repeat. 10,000 baptisms a week. Within the next six months, they had over 1 million people converted. Not necessarily a Seventh-day Adventist, but converted, accepting Jesus. And so listen carefully what happened now. After five months of prayer, she says that, and I have the quotation, that our people didn't see the results as fast as they expected, and they stopped praying. They didn't see the results as fast. Pastor, I get a phone call from, I'm not going to tell you the country, somewhere in Europe. Pastor, we've been praying for three months, nothing happened. We are going to stop. I've been going to the medical school for three months and they didn't let me do a surgery yet on human brain. You cannot pray for three months and expect the second coming. Ellen White actually answers to that. She said the, whole, the, the church members were wholly unfitted to receive the latter rain because they didn't continue to pray. Close period. The church members were wholly unfitted to receive the latter rain because they didn't keep praying. Because when you start to pray, God starts to work, but God has to work with people, and people are stubborn. And you need to keep praying so God could keep working until everybody is ready. Because God loves everybody. And he wants as many as possible saved. They should have kept praying. They should have kept praying. And then she says, something happened. And the history says that, that not so much the spirit of prophecy. The history says that the government offered free land if you would start a farm. And our members stopped praying and went to get free land. And then they found gold in California. And then new ships came with immigrants in New York offering cheap labor, and our people got busy with business, and they stopped praying. And she says, revival stopped happening. Now, think about this. When they started to pray, and these men got them together in, in, in Central Park, it says it spread all over the U.S., listen carefully, and then Canada, very interesting, and then it went to U.K., England, it went to Central Europe, South Africa, India, Australia, Brazil, Chile, all over South America, and it surrounded the whole world 
in revival. And they prayed only five months. What would have happened if, we, if they would have kept praying? And she says, God sent angels to prepare the world, but they stopped praying. Now, in that time, in that time, when that happened in New York, in England, it was the Keswick Convention. Revival started. When revival started in England, revival started in Chicago, Moody. When revival started in Chicago, I could go on and on. It just exploded all over the world. Because our members prayed for five months. What would happen today if we would pray together for the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> now I'm going to move on because we don't have time. I want to finish because I'm hungry. But anyway... Yeah. I'm going to jump a little. In 1901, Ellen White appealed to them again to pray. And she had a vision. And she says, in the vision, they had the meetings, and in the meetings, they started to pray together for the Holy Spirit, to pray for revival, and they humbled themselves, she says. They confessed sins to each other, and then she says, brother, and she names a letter, brother so-and-so stood up, and she says, went to brother so-and-so and said, please forgive me. And then she asked forgiveness, another one, and another one, and soon enough, she says, I saw them in the vision, confessing to one another. There was repentance, the Holy Spirit came, and she says, everybody could sense the presence of God. And she says, there was a strong sense that the Holy Spirit was there. And then she says, I woke up from the vision. And she says, what would have been if they prayed and confessed and humbled themselves? But they didn't. And now listen carefully. She appealed to them, let's start praying. In 1901, they started to pray again. When they started to pray, she says, again, God sent angels to prepare the world for the second coming. When they started to pray again in 1901, second time, Evan Roberts in England, in Welsh, started to also pray. He was a young man. He went to church. He was sitting in the front right next to a girl. The pastor started to preach on the need of the Holy Spirit. And then the pastor says, we will never receive the Holy Spirit before we understand the cross. And then the pastor said, God died for you. In that moment, Evan Roberts was on the first seat, had a revelation. He says, what? And the pastor looks to him because he disturbed the sermon. And the pastor said, God died for you. And Evan Roberts dropped on his knees and started to cry. God, he says, died for me? And the girl next to him says, hey, sit down and keep quiet. Let the pastor continue. And if you read the whole story, the guy says, this is too big to be quiet. This is too big to be quiet. And he says, if God died for me, why don't we get together and pray that we love him to die for him too? And then he says, if this is so big, why don't we tell everybody? If you believe that God died for you, why don't you tell everybody so they all understand this? And he says, I am calling. He was not the pastor. He says, I am calling the church. So we pray for revival. When Evan Roberts said that, the whole church responded. Instead of looking to the pastor, they looked to him and they say, we come. They all came to prayer. And they started to come every evening. And then two churches, and then three churches, then the whole city. And after three months, history says, very powerful. History says that, listen, they closed the police station and the court. And the journalist went there and says, why do you close the court? And the guy says, since people in the whole city got converted, there are no more crimes. So lawyers and judges lost their jobs. So when he went to the police station, why do you close the police station? And he found the police singing. He says, what are you doing? And they said, since there are no more crimes, we developed a choir and we go from church to church and sing for revival meetings. So what was the police doing? Singing. Isn't that amazing? And this Welsh revival, and we need to finish, this Welsh revival spread worldwide through Scandinavia, Central Europe, Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, 
and eventually went to Korea and called the Korean Revival, and eventually went to China called the Manchurian Revival, and surrounded the whole world. And then she says, our people stopped praying again because they didn't see the results. And the revival stopped. And she says, Jesus could have come. I don't know if we get it, but I'm going to stop with a story. We continue in the afternoon with a little more personal note. I'm going to go with a few slides. This message, this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It's the third angel message, which is to proclaim with a loud voice, attended with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in large measure. This message of mercy is the revelation of his character of love. This message understood, it will be proclaimed and it will lighten the whole earth. Now let's go to the next one. The message of Christ's righteousness is to be sound from end to end to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. This message will be attended. Isn't that powerful? I could go on and on and on. I have here a bunch of paragraphs. We just don't have time. Now listen, folks. We finish now with a question. And the story. The question is, if we know that we need the Holy Spirit, that we don't have a chance in your power, in my power, to finish the work, if we know that you cannot change have you tried to overcome your sins? Have you tried, honestly? I was born with a temper. I was born a bomb. You know what a bomb is? I explode in a second. I cannot stand slow people. I just cannot. When I drive and to drive parallel and slow, it drives me crazy. I was born angry, fast, accomplishing a lot and not having patience with slow people. I can, when you talk, I already know the answer and it, I hate when it takes you forever to tell me something. Just tell me! <laughs> and I had to try again and again and again and again and again and again to be patient. And I never managed. And I remember one time I was playing with my dog, my grandparents' dog. And it was a dog that would go behind the ship. And the dog had fleas. And I would catch fleas and throw them in the tub where you take a shower. And the fleas would jump and stop, jump and stop, and get tired and eventually die. And one time I told my dad, I cannot overcome my temper. And my father said, you and the fleas. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, you try as the fleas try. And they die trying. And you will die trying. And I said, what do you want me to do? And my father said, your, your war is not to fight Satan. That's Jesus' war. Your war is to be filled with the Spirit. Whoa. Isn't that big? Your war is not to fight Satan. You'll never win that war. Your war is to be filled with the Spirit. And my father said, focus less on changing self. Focus more on God's presence. And he said, you don't overcome darkness fighting darkness. You just turn the light on. He said, make sure that you are filled by the Spirit and Satan has no power over you. Isn't that something? Well, let me give you the story and we finish for now. Um, when talking about prayer, I was in one of the countries and I preached in 2004, long ago. 2004, that's 100 years ago. I preached and nobody moved. I'm not going to tell you the country, but nobody. I was preaching my heart out and prayed and prayed and preached and preached. And they would not even move. I was like, breathe! So I know that you are not dead. <clears throat> nobody moved. You're like... And I was kind of discouraged. I went back to the hotel and I prayed, Lord, it's sacrifice to be away from home, to be away from my wife. Please make sure that there will be results. And I prayed and went back and preached. Nothing happened. And I left. In 2017, I was in Czech Republic. And uh, a, a member, I'm not going to tell you his name, 
from the division there told me, he says, Pavel, you know what happened in Bergamo? And I said, uh, where is Bergamo? <laughs> he said, well, Bergamo is next to Milan in Italy. And I said, no, I don't know what happened in Bergamo. I've never been in Bergamo. He said, you don't know what happened? I said, no, I don't know what happened. He says, well, the church exploded. I thought, did anybody put fire or something? <laughs> and he said, a lady from Bergamo came to that country when you preached in 2004. And she listened and she actually practiced. She went back. And she recorded the whole sermon and she listened to it again and again and again. And then she started to pray every morning for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then she went to a few other ladies. The church in Bergamo has had in that time roughly 40 members, not all attending. She started to pray with other ladies and they would meet at the church at 4.30, I'm sorry, 6.30. I'm, I'm hungry, you can see that. I'm eating words instead of food. Anyway, they started to pray at 6.30 in the morning together. As they were praying together, after about two, three months, the lady called me. So we had been praying for three months and nothing happened. We got tired. How long should we pray? How long? And I said, well, prayer is the breath of the soul. Let me ask you, how long do you breathe? <laughs> because Elena says, slow down the, 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 the exercise of prayer and you will die spiritually. I said, how long do you breathe? The Bible says, pray without ceasing. I suppose that's the answer. And I said to her, lady, prayer is not an event. Prayer, it's a way of life. And you should consider it a privilege. So keep praying. She said, well, I was looking for a different answer, like three months, six months, you know. <laughs> I said, well, do you want something to happen? Keep praying because God has to work with people. And that's not easy. They kept praying. I knew nothing. She didn't call me back. After a few months of prayer, every morning, together at the church, a few ladies, the neighbor next door, across the street, knocks in the door at 6.30. They open the door. Can we help you? And he says, why do you come every morning at 6 or 6.30? You used to come only Saturday. I work night shift. When I come, now every day I have to look for a place to park because your cars block all the parking. What are you doing every day here? They say, we pray. What do you pray for? We pray for the city. We pray for the Holy Spirit. He says, I don't believe in church. In Italy, many people hate the church because the church, the Catholic church, takes by law, government law, 3% of every citizen's salary and gives it to the Catholic Church. 3%. And if you don't want your money to go to the Catholic Church, you write a petition and they will take it, 3%, but give it to another church that you choose. But if you don't write the petition, by law, 3% of your salary will go to the Catholic Church. And people hate it. Plus, churches are dying in Italy. Churches are museum. Only tourists visit churches. You follow me? And so he says, I hate church and politics and taking our money. But he says, I do believe in prayer. And they are quiet. And he says, you meet here every day to pray for the city? Yes. Would you pray for my wife? She has terminal cancer. The doctor gave her three months. She's in stage four metastasis. And they said, sure. They pray for his wife every morning. A week later, he comes with his wife hand in hand. We want to be baptized. They said, Why? We want to be baptized. You, you don't know what we believe. I don't care. Teach me. I believe whatever, whatever you believe. But we don't worship Sunday. I worship whenever you worship. I don't care what day. But we don't eat this and that. I eat whatever you eat. Just baptize me. So doctrines were not the issue. And they said, you, just, you want to be baptized? Yes. Why? And he said, well, I came here last week. This week, I went to the doctor for a doctor appointment. And the doctor said, what have you done? She's cancer free. It's all done. And he said, that's because you prayed. And that tells me that you don't have only doctrines. You have God. And he said, God's presence is here. And I want to be here. People are looking for God. He got baptized with his wife. 
But that's not the story. He went to the neighbor. He says, you know, my wife is cancer free. What treatment? Now this church is praying. And the neighbor said, my kids are in prison for drugs. So he goes, can you pray for my kids? Soon enough, long story short, from word of mouth, from neighbor to neighbor, every morning at 6.30, there was a long line going around the block, around the block, around the block of people from the city coming to be prayed for. Wouldn't it be something if the city would know that this church is praying for them and they would come to be prayed for? And the church started to do Bible studies and Bible Expo, whatever that is. I talked to my cousin, who is the union president there, and he said, they did Bible Expo, they did Bible studies, they did food, they did this and that and that and that. And he said, we could not help. There were so many visitors, we had no more room. And the church went from 40 to about 250. And then they had no more room in the building, so they planted a second and a third church. Three churches all together. Why? Because a group of ladies got together and prayed for the Holy Spirit. And they didn't pray only for three months. They keep praying. Do you follow me? What stops you to do that? Except comfort? Don't look for a miracle. Don't look for instant growth, instant explosion, a voice. Pastor, you didn't hear the voice of God, somebody told me. I said to them, oh, yeah, I only hear my wife's voice. I don't, I don't hear the voice of God either. Don't pray for a voice. Don't pray for a miracle. Pray because Jesus told you to get together and pray. Period. Obey his command. Isn't that clear enough? But as you get together and pray together for the Holy Spirit and pray for the city, Elena says, humble yourself, confess to one another and to God so there is nothing. Make sure that there is unity so that would not, because she says our lack of unity stops the Holy Spirit. Basically, when we unite, we open the way for the Holy Spirit to come. And so on and so forth. All that I told you. Folks, let's close with prayer. But I am, God is making an appeal. I believe. This is not a sermon, folks. I believe that I am here to call you to prayer. And I believe that our church, sooner or later, is going to do this. Because the, the spirit of prophecy clearly says that it will happen. And the latter rain will come. And the latter rain is going to be more abundant than the former rain. And many will be baptized. Thousands. You remember the quotations? But also she says that many will leave the churches. So the question is, what group do you want to be in? It would be extremely sad after a life, 20, 40, whatever years of being an Adventist, to lose everything because you just don't do what Jesus told you to do. Remember the virgins. Five taken. Five left. So God is calling you to make it, to make a commitment, to start praying, not for some reason. You can do that at home. To start praying for revival. Start praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Start praying that this church is going to reach the whole city. Start praying that this church is going to re reach the whole California. Why not? My former church, they prayed that they would reach the world. That was pretty crazy. In a local small church to pray that you reach the world. And within two years, there were 96 countries. First it was 20, 30, 40. I remember when the media coordinator told me, Pastor, we have 80 some church, uh, countries already listening. 80 some countries. That was big for a local church. And then 90, and then we got to half million a month listening to the messages. And then people getting baptized all over the world. Because the church was praying. What if every church would do that? God is making an appeal to you. Don't look for anything. Just get together and pray. You will get the blessing. 
your soul, your family will get the blessing. Your church will get the blessing. And you'll rejoice and you'll have a story. Amen? Amen. May God bless you richly. We'll continue in the afternoon. We'll go a little into more personal part. Let's close with prayer and then we, we have songs or something or no? No? Okay. Let's close with prayer. What I'm going to do, I'm going to give you two minutes to pray privately. Say like, Jesus, please forgive me that I've been so comfortable. Forgive me that I had other priorities that I thought I love you, but I loved myself. Please forgive me and give me strength and joy to cast their prayer a privilege. Help me focus on the cross. Help me understand the cross. Focus daily on the cross. Spend time daily looking into the cross and say, Jesus, help me to make it a priority daily to see the cross until I love you more than self. You follow me? And say, Jesus, I pray that you are going to not only revive me, but revive my family and revive our church and do things that would glorify you and save people. Pray for that. Because God has been waiting for you to pray that prayer. And he doesn't need to be begged. When you do that, angels start jumping happy, up, up and down. And they say, finally. You, you understand? Pray for that. And believe, though you don't understand, that he will answer above what you pray. Take two minutes and then we have a, I will have a closing prayer. Amen. Father in heaven, what a privilege to come together in your presence and claim your promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Father, you heard every prayer. You know every heart. We pray together that you, that you will answer every single prayer. These precious people that are here, you know every desire, but you know what they really need because you know us. So we pray together that you answer better than we pray. We pray that you help us daily spend quality time with you. Daily spend time at the foot of the cross. That you help us understand more and more the love of God that surpasses any human understanding. We pray that you help us Understand the love of God so much that you'll be transformed and love you more than anything. We pray that we are going to spread this message, the good news, to others so others get joy and hope. We pray that you are going to revive ourselves, revive our families, revive the church. We pray for the community. There are so many precious souls that have no hope yet. We pray for them, Lord. Please, Use this church to be a light and a blessing. We know that you can do it and we expect an answer to our prayer. We pray in Jesus' precious name, in his merits alone, and we thank you for answering. We love you, we praise you. Amen.